Hey, I'm Sean Canungo. This is another episode of Dangerous Ideas. We break down concepts and frameworks that will change your life. Hey everyone, another episode of Dangerous Ideas. This is episode number 23 and we made it to 23. And if you're new to this pod, what we do in this pod is we break down ideas and concepts that will change your life, uh, change your business, your career, but most importantly, your life. And I'm super excited about this episode. This could be a solo episode, but we're going to be changing it up. And I'm actually, this might be the episode that I'm most excited about uh, because what we're going to be doing is... I'm not going to be coming up with all the dangerous ideas. Um, what what I do is uh, usually during the week, I'm like just ingesting all these this content from uh, folks around the world. And, and this is content that's not the most super popular content that everybody is digesting. I'm grabbing content from things that only one person has listened to or like a hundred people have listened to, like, like very unpopular uh episodes or takes from from everywhere around the world and I'm bringing it to you. I'm curating some of the best dangerous ideas and bringing it to you. This is going to be in addition to the interviews that we do and everything else. So I'm excited to be bringing these ideas uh, to you and we have five incredible dangerous ideas. So uh, the first dangerous idea um, is from a podcast that I've been listening to from Eric Sue, um, and he had Mark Manson on. Now, if you don't know who Mark Manson is, Mark Manson is from, uh, um, I guess, literary fame, uh, subtle art uh, of not giving a fuck. Uh, also did Will Smith's memoir and these two guys talking about marketing and content and creators. And there was an amazing clip from Mark Manson that was a couple minutes long talking about why he's been doubling down on the creator economy and how he is becoming a creator and doubling down on video. And to be honest with you, you know I've been talking about this power shift to individuals uh, for years, and this is a huge concept that I talk about in this podcast, but I think he breaks it down very beautifully in this particular episode. Play the clip. And I think you're starting to see that, you know, you mentioned the Paul brothers, um, Mr. Beast with Feastables. Like, we're just now discovering that that brand relationship between a creator and their audience is so fucking massively powerful for non-content businesses. And so I, I imagine that we're probably going to end up at a point where, where yeah, it's just a massive amount of free value is given mm -hmm. up front. And then there's like associated businesses on the back end, you know, like, oh, yeah. by the way, buy my chocolate bar next time you're at the grocery store or, you know, drink prime next time you're thirsty. Right. And that's actually where all the money's made. There's an argument that in the next 10, 20 years or so, you're only going to have like the top tier creators and then you're going to have this long tail, right? So it's mm. like, you mentioned the, maybe you agree with this because you just said the keyword land grab, right? Yeah. And when I think about land grab, typically I'm thinking about early days, social apps, like yeah, you got to take as much attention as possible. But land grab also typically means that you're willing to burn a lot of money yeah. to get there. So how are you thinking about this? I'm thinking I'm burning a lot of money to get there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's so funny, man. Like I talk to, I'll talk to like some entrepreneur friends about like all the, they'll be like, how's the YouTube thing going? But, you know, I'll like be like, oh, we're doing this and doing that yeah. and the other thing. And he, and every once in a while they'll be like, oh, so. You making money? Yeah. Are you making any money? I'm like, no, dude, I'm fucking, I'm like setting briefcases of money on fire yeah. left and right. Yeah. Uh, it's the first time in my career I've done this, but yeah. to your point about the long tail versus like the, the handful of winners, the reality is that if you look at Every creative industry, whether it's music, film, stage performers, like whatever, art, uh, painting, you know, it's, you always end up with winners take most. Like it's, it's. What a dangerous idea. This idea that um, this is one of the biggest land grabs in human history right now. Uh, the ability to build an audience, to build distribution today because there's going to be a winner-take-all uh, mentality moving forward when it comes to creators is huge. I mean, it's it's massive. And here you have somebody like Mark Manson who's already been incredibly successful, one of the most um, – profitable books in the last decade, uh, Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And 
obviously super successful with Will Smith's book as well, like doubling down on this whole video game because he understands even watching um, somebody like Will Smith and being in the creator space for a very long time that this is it. Like there's a there's a land grab right now in terms of creators in this particular space and those who build their own brand in this particular space will be the ones that will win in the future. And it you don't have to be, in my opinion, you don't have to be the biggest creator in the world. I believe that if you are building your own brand equity, your own IP in your particular niche, that that's where you're going to win. A, a, a beautiful example is one of my friends, Alec uh, Barbero. He's uh, I don't even know if his last name is Barbero, but he he he, he goes on Instagram as uh, Alec Barbero. I go to his um, uh, his shop to get a to get to get a haircut. He he's an absolute genius when it comes to content. He's mixing what he does very well, which is his talent for barbering with content, and now he's getting millions of views on videos and. On he's basically giving people uh, these kids perms and. He's, he's shooting the content in his barbershop, and he's getting millions of views. People are literally flooding his store to get these haircuts, and it makes sense. His integration between content and his talent around being a great barber, he's mixing those things together, and that's what's been you know, filling up his shop. Take that idea of a traditional business, of being a barber, of being a chef, of being a dentist, whatever it might be, cementing your brand in this particular space. And as we look five to 10 years out, this is going to be the case in many, many fields. And I think Mark Manson outlined it very clearly that essentially uh, this is what creators are doing right now. If you look at what Mr. Beast is doing with his brand called Feasibles or Kim Kardashian with Skims or Logan Paul and, and KSI with um, you know, Prime, to be honest with you, um, if you actually look later in the pod, he says that these creators are actually creating the 21st century media companies. And in my opinion, they are creating the 21st century brands. I believe that when we look at the S&P 500 or the Fortune 500 um, you know, companies, they're going to be creator-led brands, a big portion of them. And the other brands will be the, you know, the incumbents, like the LVMH, the McDonald's, the Nikes, the Adidas's. They, they will still be there because – of they're just accruing you know value because of their brand name but the net new brands the ones that will make me making a dent in the universe those will all be creator led brands so what does this mean from a dangerous idea perspective i believe that it means that no matter what business that you are in no matter what you are doing that creating your own brand equity your own ip um is radically more important today than any time in history. And you can see why people are doubling down. As Mark Manson, Mark Manson mentioned, he's like burning briefcases of cash in order to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. So um, I got that clip from Eric Sue, Mark Mance's podcast. To be honest with you, I think it has like 9,000 views. It doesn't have a lot of views. I grabbed that. Um, incredible. Now, the next... Uh, dangerous idea is actually piggybacking off this particular idea. And it shows the power of the individual. And if, if, if you've been following this pod or been following me for a long time, it's the reason why I wrote the book, The Bold Ones. The, the reason why I wrote the book, the book, The Bold Ones, is talking about this power shift to individuals. And I fundamentally believe that an individual today can make a dent in the universe, that one person can make a billion dollar impact, and maybe even one person can make a billion dollar uh, company. And in this particular clip, love this clip because it shows the power of the individual uh, very clearly. This clip is from the Joe Pomp Show. And uh, Joe Pomp, Joe Pompliano is a great thought leader and thinker and tweeter uh, in this particular space between the intersection of business and sports, uh, one of my favorite podcasts. 
And this is there's not even a video to this podcast. It's just me grabbing a clip from his podcast episode. And he said something that I have never heard in my entire life, which is the Doug Flutie effect. Now, if you don't know who Doug Flutie is, Doug Flutie is a former CFL and NFL football player. Uh, he in college, he played for Boston and one of the most incredible CFL players to ever live. He was a short, you know, he was a tiny guy, he played QB, but he was incredible. And I never heard of the Doug Flutie effect. I never heard about um, how Doug Flutie actually made a dent into his university's uh, admissions and enrollment. So uh, this is Joe Pomp talking about the Doug Flutie effect uh, because this is essentially uh, what Nick Saban did to... um, to Oklahoma State. So this is uh, Joe Pomp talking about it. Nick Saban was worth billions to this school. And I'll explain to you guys. I talked about this the other day on Twitter and I wrote about it in the past. But the general idea is this thing called the Flutie effect. Some of you guys have probably heard of it, while some of you may have not. Doug Flutie was a Boston College quarterback who successfully threw a Hail Mary to beat Miami in a nationally televised game in 1984. This captivated the country. It was everywhere. Everyone was talking about Boston College. And that athletic success led to a 30% jump in applications at Boston College over the next few years. We have also seen other examples of the Flutie effect. For example, applications jumped 13% at at Auburn after Cam Newton led them to a national championship in 2011. So I love this idea of the Doug Flutie effect. Doug Flutie sends a Hail Mary pass And literally people want to go to the school now because all the attention is on this particular school. He mentions that Nick Saban, the coach uh, uh, for, for, I I don't actually follow college football that much, but I I think he he works for Oklahoma State. Um, This guy has generated a billion dollars in revenue for that school. More people want to go to the school because how he's transformed um, that, uh, that, that team. The Doug Flutie effect. And once you see this effect, you will see it across so many different domains. Another great example of this is what Patrick Ewing, a great former NBA star, did to uh, Georgetown University. Admissions actually increased by 45%. Let me repeat. Admissions increased by 45% to Georgetown University from 1983 to 1986 when Patrick Ewing was there. One person making a dent in the universe. Doug Flutie, one person making an effect in the universe. Nick Saban. Let's let's talk about Deion Sanders and what he's done with Colorado and the Colorado Buffaloes. We talked about this in the pod before. But Doug... Um, Deion Sanders, former NFL superstar who used to play for the Dallas Cowboys, one of my favorite players ever. One of the reasons why I named my son Deion is because of Deion Sanders. Uh, he, Because of his impact to the Colorado Buffaloes, literally the ticket price of th- th- this team went up like hundreds of percentages. He's got this deal with blenders. Th- these, these sunglasses that Deion Sanders would wear, like gain – Millions of dollars every game that he would play. One person, the entire like college uh, um, football universe descending on Colorado because of Deion Sanders, because of the Doug Flutie effect. And if you see this effect happen, you can see it with Lionel Messi. One person going to Inter Miami in the MLS, striking a deal with um, with Apple, striking a deal. Um, with them literally raising the ticket price of Inter Miami by 1,800%. People are now talking about the MLS because of Lionel Messi. Because of the cities that he's going to, he's selling out. One person. If you look at Tiger Woods and what he has done, one person making a dent in the golf universe, literally generating, I've seen reports of 1.3 billion to me that is that is a minimum to the PGA th- th- think about what t- uh, Tiger Woods has done to golf in general I, I I did a keynote in 2018 with PGA Canada and I was literally sitting there with um, a golf um, uh, course owner and he said when Tiger Woods came into the game it literally doubled 
the amount of people that were interested in sports. Now, young people were wanting to get into the sport, and it was a revolution worldwide for golf owners around the world. Forget the PGA and the impact that it's made, but like just people getting into golf. That's a one-person impact. I mean, T- Taylor Swift, look what Taylor Swift has done in terms of the economy. One person, uh, the, the impact that she has made economically in the U.S., it's been stated from um, from $4.6 billion to almost $80 billion. Uh, there are reports that it's generated close to $5 billion in consumer spending in the United States. One person. One person. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that one person can really make an impact. One person can be a magnet just by their talent, their skill, the attention that they garner, they can create an entire ecosystem. They can create revenue. They can attract eyeballs. And this is what I believe when it comes to innovation. I believe is that if we can turn a individual into a juggernaut, I believe if we can turn one person into that magnet, that it can actually generate um, other startups. It can influence and, and, and create um, economic impact. This is something that we have, I've never heard an economist talking about this ever, that one person can make this type of um, economic impact and influence. We just saw it with Nick Staben, Doug Flutie, Deion Sanders, Lionel Messi, Tiger Woods, Taylor Swift. What are we talking about here? So um, I'm going to keep on talking about this impact. And I, I believe that this is going to be um, happening again and again and again because people follow people at the end of the day. They don't follow titles. They don't follow institutions. They follow people. And, um, you know, you can see the impact that one person can make. Um, and it's, it's, it's really incredible. Okay, so uh, the next piece, the next dangerous idea is a episode that I listened to uh, from this great site, uh, great brand. It's called Trapital. So they got a podcast, and I grabbed it from a video. Literally 100 people viewed this video. Only 100 people viewed this video, and they were probably playing in the background. They didn't, they didn't pay attention to uh, as, this, as much as me. And Trapital is a great publication that explores the intersection between music and business, uh, and more specifically, hip-hop and business. And in Trapital, uh, the, uh, the, the individual that was being interviewed is Tati Cristiano. I want to get her name right. She's from Media Research. And in this episode, they were dissecting the impact of radio. And as you all know, like radio has completely died. Um, but I thought what um, uh, Tati said about radio and what's happening with streaming and TikTok was really super insightful. It's a really, really short clip, but um, let's see what she says. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just how uh, just radio's role in the promotion cycle has totally flipped, right? It used to be that the song was made a hit on radio and then that that trickled to streaming and now it's the opposite. It's the songs bubble up on streaming and then radio has become, I've heard people refer to it as like phase two or like it's the last effort to sort of extend the song's life cycle, whereas it used to be at the beginning. And I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here, but it reminds me actually of what's happening now with streaming and social media because streaming used to lead social media and now social media leads streaming. So I feel like we're actually in the midst of radio's long-term decline. We're also seeing streaming's long-term, like so far, sort of starting to decline in its, um, you know, being able to propel culture where it's more so this what reacts to culture rather than driving it. I, I, I absolutely love this insight. And my dangerous idea coming out of this particular insight from Tati was that um, – The medium dictates the culture. The medium dictates where the value is captured. What do I mean by this? So if we think about music, music, um, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the hot songs we played on the radio 
and that would dictate what we listen to at the clubs, at our dinner parties, you know, and 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 what would define, you know, the culture, right? Radio helped define culture. And once you moved into the internet era and you had streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple Music, um, the culture moved to streaming. More people were listening to um, to streaming, to Spotify and Apple Music, and that's where their primary source of finding m- new music was. And so um, when streaming became really popular, as Tati mentioned, radio became like the the like the 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 second in line. Like they would play what was hot on streaming. And now what we're what we're seeing is like you went from radio to streaming, and now you're going to social media. So if you look at how TikTok now influences culture, it TikTok is now the spot where you are able to get new music. This is where people discover new sounds and new music. And this is why I believe that the medium dictates the culture. What does this mean? It means that wherever people's eyeballs are in terms of that medium, that is what dictates the culture and everything else follows that, right? So social media right now is garnering all the attention, the TikToks of the world, the IGs of the world. That's what's garnering attention. That is what's creating hits. And because of that, that's what we're listening to on streaming. And then that's what we're listening to on the radio. On, on the radio. So if I look at a song like, for example, you know, Jack Harlow. Now, Jack Harlow um, is, to me, like a you know, streaming star. It's like he's been around for, I'd say, you know, five years. I think he really popped during the 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 pandemic uh, with What's Poppin'. But if you look at his new song, you know, Lovin' On Me, my belief is that Lovin' On Me popped on TikTok and then it became popular, uh, you know, on streaming and then radio. So what this tells me is that we should be always following where people are consuming their attention and time. Like, let's not, let, you know, everyone wants, everybody wants to create something net new um, or a new place where people should be watching or listening to things. But we should go where the attention is already. And today, unfortunately, the attention is on TikTok. So if you want to dictate culture, if you want to know where uh, to put your stuff, you should put it where culture is created. And right now it's on YouTube, TikTok, and, you know, IG Reels, I would say. That's where the attention is going. That's where most of our attention is going. Um, and that's creating culture. So that, to me, is super fascinating. And if I, if, I, if I take this idea of how the medium dictates the culture, I would say the same thing exists for a Twitter. You know, Twitter is still, say what you will about Twitter, since Elon Musk took over the platform, Twitter still dictates culture, right? Back in the day, we used to read the newspaper, and then that would, uh, that would dictate where uh, our conversations would go at the water cooler, in the office, how CEOs would talk. And today, Twitter has become the new spot where, I mean, it's not even new, but I mean, over the last number of years, um, that is what's dictating culture right now because we're spending our time on it. That's what media organizations are talking about. They're talking about things that happen on Twitter and then that's what's dictating what's happening in the boardrooms and what CEOs are talking about. It's, it's remarkable. So all this to say, the newspaper used to be the culture maker and now Twitter is the culture maker. Do you know what I mean? Like, So take this to other examples, and to me what it just says is that you always have to pay attention to where everyone else is paying attention to. So my my takeaway is like just talk to more people, follow people around, be in tune what people are watching and listening to and learning, and uh, what I love to do like when I'm traveling or when I'm like in Starbucks line or I'm at on a plane or on a bus, I, I'm a creep. I am a creep. I'm looking at what people are looking at. I want to see what people are using on their phones. And what's remarkable to me is that if you go anywhere anywhere around the world, 
I, I know the I know the world is huge, but like it, it's funny if you go to Europe, if you go to South America, if you go to North America, actually our app infrastructure or like our what we are looking at on our screen is actually really similar. And so um, just fascinating how the medium dictates culture. So um, love that insight from Tati. Um, it, it, the other point to that is that I actually wrote a Medium article. Um, it's kind of meta, but I, I wrote an article in 2015. It's 2024 right now. So I wrote an article nine years ago, which is talking about the death of radio and how that um, – you know, more and more people are listening to streaming. Um, actually, Sirius Satellite Radio was supposed to be the, the big disruptor to terrestrial radio, and that didn't really happen. And now you have Spotify and Apple Music and podcasts taking over. And my thesis back in 2015 was that radio was going to die or is dying. And it is dying. Let, let's not be honest. Let's be honest. It is dying, but it's not dead. It's not dead. And I think part of the reason why it's not dead is because – um, there's something, number, number one, uh, the people that used to listen to radio are still alive. So if you're like in your fifties and sixties, uh, you know, that's probably the, the biggest cohort of people that are listening to radio. They're not dead yet. They're still here. That's why radio is still alive. And there's actually something really elegant of, about radio. And actually I would say there's something really elegant about television. It's funny because as we have become more technologically advanced, for some reason, we've actually created more friction in that sense. So what do I mean? Like back in the day, or I mean, what do I mean back in the day? Today, if you want to listen to radio, you literally just press a button and you, uh, the radio will come on. And if you want to change the channel, you just like twist the knob. Like incredibly fix frictionless experience, incre incredible user um, experience. Same thing with television. Television, you... You turn on and you can flip a channel just by a button. And today, if you're using Netflix, you gotta you know you gotta you gotta go into Netflix and then you gotta go and search for the the, the thing and then you gotta press into it and then you gotta press play. Like there's a, there's a lot more friction uh, to using um, television now, like like streaming, which most people are using, and even like Spotify. If I want to go to Spotify, okay, I gotta go to like my Spotify, then I gotta click there, then I gotta click to new episodes, then I gotta click to the podcast. Like, I mean, it's a lot of work. And there's something beautiful and elegant about radio and television. Um, anyways, I digress. Okay, so let's keep on going. Another dangerous idea. Um, now, this dangerous idea is from, a, from one of my uh, favorite authors. Uh, her name is Pauline Brown. And she wrote a great book called Aesthetic Intelligence. And what I do periodically is I try to find – I should just call Pauline because I've, I've actually messaged her and I said, hey, your book was super impactful to me. And I periodically try to look for podcasts with her because I just want to hear her thoughts and her ideas around what's happening in the culture. Uh, Pauline, had, had, she was, she's the former um, uh, leader of LVMH um, in North America. So her insights on luxury and branding I think are incredible. And so I periodically try to listen to to see if I can find episodes with Pauline talking. And I grabbed an episode with uh, this guy named Brandon Berkmeyer, who evidently, and I even like I don't I'm not even following. I mean I should be following his pod called Brands on Brands. I actually met him in Orlando this summer. He actually came up to me after my keynote, and he was like, you know, he was saying how amazing it was, and and shout out to Brandon. And I said, Brandon, you don't, you know, it's crazy. Like I have like listened to your podcast. You don't even know that. Um, and this episode with Pauline Brown literally had one view on it. Let me repeat this podcast episode with Brad. This is not, I don't know, maybe it was posted later or whatever. This episode has one view on it. And I listened to the whole thing. Um, to me, this was an incredible idea, a dangerous idea from this episode from Brands on Brands with Pauline Brown and Brandon Berkmeyer. Um, you can drop it now. And by the way, if, if we were buying, whether it's fashion or whether it's a car, because we needed it purely for the utility, then what I'm talking about really has no relevance in this conversation. But 90% of what we buy 
is not for utility. Or if it is for utility, that may be why we bought, you know, we bought a car, but it's not why we bought that Audi or even that Toyota. We picked that because it had some sort of emotional connection to us. And marketers make the mistake time and again of thinking a lot about functions and features and essentially utility. And you have to offer, you know, the right functions and features, but you're not going to win on the right functions and features. You're going to win on uh, on the right emotional connection. And one of the most powerful ways to connect with people emotionally is through their senses. Whoo! Let me let me break down what Pauline said. Um, that ninety percent of the stuff that we have, we don't need. Ninety percent of the stuff that we have that we don't need, and the ten percent of the stuff that we do need, that there's some utility to that. So that means the rest of the ninety percent. Why are we buying that, right? If it's not giving us direct utility, well, what we're actually buying is we're buying an emotional connection. What we are buying is the why. What we're buying is the story. What we're buying is, is, um, you know, an idea. We're buying imagination. That's what she's saying. 90% of the stuff that we buy is just part of our own imagination. And the biggest mistake that marketers make is that, they focus way too much on the utility and the features when they should be focusing on the reason why we buy it, the emotional connection, the why, the story, the, 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 uh, the, um, the narrative around, uh, around that. And so it's a great reminder to whatever you are building or whatever you are uh, you know, wanting to produce that really comes down to our emotional connection to it. And I think this is a great reminder. And I think we should step back and actually ask ourselves when we're buying something new, whether it's a product or a service, you should ask yourself, why do I need this? Or why does it cost, why does it cost this much? And break it down. Part of the reason why we buy certain products is because of what it means to us or what it's going to signal to others. I mean, I know we've been talking about this in this podcast for a very long time around the idea of costly signaling and status and and all those pieces. But here's somebody that has um, made a living innovating in this world of luxury. And luxury is the most fascinating industry on the planet because it's something that we don't need. We don't need luxury products. We don't need a luxury car. We don't need luxury fashion. In fact, most of us shouldn't be having it and we can't afford it. Yet the reason why we buy it is because of the story. It's because of the imagination. And I, I think it's a great example of saying, if you are offering something, no matter what it is, Quit focusing on the features and focus on how you can connect with them on an emotional level to sell uh, what you want to sell. And I think that's a great reminder and uh, a podcast episode with one view, but I'm bringing it to I'm bringing these insights to you. So uh, let's go to the to the uh, to the next piece, which is uh, probably one of my favorite podcasts, which is from the All In Podcast. And this is from uh, uh, somebody that I've been following for a very long time, Chamath Palihapitiya. Uh, One of the most unique original thinkers out there. And he he said something very interesting when it comes to the technology industry today. So let's uh, let's drop that. Have you been to a McDonald's recently? I actually went to McDonald's, yeah. You order through an app now and there's a big screen. The point is you walk in there and it's probably not the McDonald's you knew 15 or 20 years ago. It's not about waiting in line and ordering. And it, it, that's not how it works anymore. There, so the point is, is that a tech-enabled business or is that still a restaurant? Well, if you spend a lot of your time intellectually contorting yourself to try to justify why the next version of McDonald's is a tech-enabled business, you're just going to lose a lot of money. It's a restaurant. Yeah. Now, all restaurants need technology. And what you see by McDonald's is even the oldest and most established are running forward very quickly to implement technology because they know that it creates efficiency, which then flows to the bottom line for them. Yeah. So the reality is that we have lived in this wonderland 
where we've looked at these software businesses that have 80 and 90% gross margins and imposed that expectation on other markets, and then made investment decisions by trying to justify how that it's a tech enabled real estate business, a tech enabled healthcare business, a tech enabled energy business without being honest with ourselves that those businesses have over decades because of lots of competition, found a consistent and reliable resting place in terms of gross margins far below 80 and 90 percent and so instead of willing tech enabled businesses to be at 80 and 90 and tricking oneself i think it's more realistic to ask yourself why aren't 80 and 90 percent gross margin businesses decaying to 30 and 40 percent gross margins like every other part of the economy when everything will be technology enabled i think that that's a very reasonable question and i think the answer is there is no safe place i don't think that you can justify 80 and 90 percent gross margins in software when you can use a model and whip up a competitor. I just think that we are all going to a place where everything is a tech-enabled version of something. <laughs> um, the dangerous idea here is that the technology hype is over. The tech hype is over. Back in the day... You used to be able to sprinkle a little bit of AI. You'd be able to sprinkle some technology, say mobile, say cloud, put it in the deck, put in the AI, and then you would get a huge bag. You would get a huge, you know, Series A bag. Um, Even if you were a service-based business. But today, everything is technology-infused. McDonald's is technology-infused. You know, your dentist is technology-infused. Even a... A, a pure play software company obviously is is technology infused, but you see, investors used to pay uh, an extraordinary amount because they thought that they were going to get these incredible returns from these businesses. When reality, I think we were all fooling ourselves. At the end of the day, these service businesses or these asset intensive businesses, they're they're just a restaurant is a restaurant. It uses electricity and it uses AI. It's still a restaurant. It's not an electric- electricity-fueled business. It's not an AI-fueled business. It's just a business at the end of the day. And I think we've been fooling ourselves over the last you know, couple decades because we've been calling all these companies tech companies when really they're not tech companies. They're not AI companies. They're just regular companies. They're a furniture company. They're a, they're a candle company. They're a whatever company. They're selling something, and yeah, they're using technology in the background. And the other insight is that all these pure play digital companies, um, they like the, 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 their moats are becoming s- difficult to... Um, justify if they're purely based on technology, especially in a world of AI, when you can replicate almost any code, you can replicate almost any business um, using AI. My dangerous idea is that anything that is digital will be replicated. Let me repeat, anything that is digital will be replicated. A website, an app, an image, that an AI can reverse engineer that. And so if you are a pure play software company, um, I believe that technology is becoming increasing, increasing more of a commodity. And what is going to give you a disproportionate advantage is probably your community, your, your network, your API partners, your, you know, like, I'll give you an example of this. Like, if you're a business like um, Slack, Slack is a, you know, basically a WhatsApp for business. Now, I believe that using AI, that you could probably recreate a billion dollar business like Slack relatively quickly. Salesforce bought Slack uh, a number of years ago. And I think what's the, 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 the new innovation for Slack is not necessarily the tech, but the innovation can be their integrations between different APIs, connecting with other partners. Uh, other partners. Now, that takes a lot of human skill, right, to develop those partnerships, those relationships, and that is a differentiator at the end of the day. But the c- core tech can be replicated. And my belief is that in the future, 
anything that's digital will be replaceable and and something that you can quickly spin up using AI. So what does that mean? I believe that your moat in the future comes back to brand, authenticity, transparency, relationship, uh, customers having an affinity towards you. You, in a world where technology is becoming increasingly commoditized, in a world, world where knowledge is becoming increasingly commoditized, the only thing that cannot be commoditized is brand. You can't, you can buy tech, you can buy knowledge, you can buy talent, you can't buy brand. You can't buy it. You cannot buy brand unless you're buying like a heritage brand, um, you know, f- you know, from the 60s or 70s or 80s. Like you cannot buy an audience. And as we, I, I think this is full circle, right? This is the reason why we come back to the Mark Manson hot take around this land grab right now when it comes to audience. Because at the end of the day, because of AI, The only thing that matters at the end of the day as technology becomes more commoditized is brand. And what Chamath broke down is that we have, we have been telling ourselves a lie. We've been telling ourselves a lie that a company like WeWork is a tech company and it deserves the valuation that it deserves when in reality it's just a Regis using tech. I think we have lied to ourselves that, you know, all these companies that are pitching themselves as AI companies, really at the end of the day, they're just a regular company. And uh, I think this is incredibly exciting. It's exciting for everyone around the world globally that technology has become more commoditized. And I believe that the differentiator for the future is no longer tech or that knowledge. The differentiator is hunger. Are you able to build the brand? Are you able to connect with a customer? Are you able to build that emotional connection? Are you able to um, sell the story? Are you able to sell the narrative at the end of the day? And if I would connect every little thing that we talked about, we talked about um, this this land grab when it comes to creators. We talked about the power of the individual. We talked about the medium dictating culture. We talked about why people buy. It all comes back to the same, same thing, which is the individual. It comes down to you. It comes down to the person and how the human becomes the most disruptive entity in the world. And to me... If I would summarize this entire podcast, not only episode, but the reason why dangerous ideas exist is because the most disruptive entity in the world is the individual. The most dangerous thing in the world is the individual. And this is why I started the podcast. This is why I wrote the book, The Bold Ones, because I believe this to my core. My conviction is so strong when it comes to this. So these are some of the the takes that I that I got uh, from all these things, and I, I want to continue this because I I, I don't want to be the, the 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 person that comes up with, with all the dangerous ideas. I believe that we can learn from um, others, and I'm gonna I'm gonna promise to you that we're gonna. This is not just the popular ideas that everyone is uh, taking a look at. These are ideas uh, from. Things that you you absolutely you have not heard. Most of these takes are from things that no one is listening to or no one has heard before. So I'm trying to give you unique, um, you you know, takes. And to be honest with you, part of the reason why I'm doing this is because I live in a city, um, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Shout out to anybody in Edmonton listening to this. Um, To be honest with you. Um, the list of people that I would get from an interview perspective that would give you these insights is actually super limited. It's not because we don't have talented people in Edmonton. It's because I don't have people that you're going to go off and listen to. It will be one person. It'll, it'll be like Daryl Cates and you'll be like, okay, I'm done with it. I'm good. Um, this is why I love remixing ideas from other people and bringing this in. We're still going to have guests and you know, and get their takes on, on some of my dangerous ideas and dangerous ideas that we're seeing. But I think this is a really cool format. Now, what we typically do at the end of this uh, episode is, is talk about some hot topics that um, that uh, you know that are out in the ether. And um, I just want to bring up uh, one hot take, which was in our last episode, Neve 
had the hottest take in the world, which was the biggest star in the future will be Tate McRae. Now, Tate McRae, if you don't know, is an artist from uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. She's got like some of the hottest songs on the planet right now. She's one of the new promising young stars. Um, what's funny is that yesterday, or maybe two nights ago, um, she was sitting courtside at the Laker game with Olivia Rodrigo watching LeBron. And there's a funny moment where like Olivia Rodrigo was like talking to Tate McRae as if uh, she was like thinking of like how to, how to get LeBron. Anyways, it, it, it went viral and it was hilarious looking at all the clips from this people talking about like, who the hell are these people? Like, why, why are people posting about these people? Like, I, I have no idea who these people are. I sent this to a group chat and like, um, some people were like, I I've never seen these people in my life. Like who, who are you guys talking about? And I think that's, by the way, that's just the state of culture is that no one is going to know the young people. Like if you are, if, if you are star in the, in your twenties or thirties today, ain't nobody going to know you. Okay. And so it was just funny. People were like, who, who's Tate McRae and like Olivia Rodrigo. Um, anyways, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was really funny. And, uh, just, just bringing it for a full circle that um, it's very difficult to create new superstars today. It's like almost impossible. Um, the, the superstars of today, like the Brad Pitts, the Will Smiths, the, the Taylor Swifts, the Beyonce's, the Drake's of the world, they are the last superstars. These new superstars coming up, ain't nobody gonna know them, unfortunately. That's just because of the fragmentation of media. If you wanna learn about that, you can go back to the last episode. I thought it was, I thought it was really great. Um, any other hot takes, new hot takes, is um, uh, things that are happening in the culture. I, I can't have anything that pops to, to mind right now, but I really appreciate you rocking with me. Uh, thank you so much for listening to Dangerous Ideas. I would really, really, really hope that you could uh, rate, review, Follow, subscribe to this pod. Um, it, it does a lot. Thank you so much. My name is Sean Kudungo.